Uh, welcome back to the second part of this lecture on anterior segment disease. We're going to continue talking about glaucoma. Um, so what is glaucoma? We're going to talk about the underlying pathology and help us understand you know, the fundamental, you know, what, what is the underlying cause of glaucoma. Um, and also by understanding the anatomy of glaucoma to understand the challenges of treatment and talk about the clinical signs and, and then go on to the treatment, uh, both medical and surgical treatment and a little bit about primary lens laxation, which is a specific form of secondary glaucoma. So we can think of the eye uh, in the same way as a bathtub. The eye has a tap which produces aqueous humour and it has a drain which drains away the aqueous humour to be resorbed by the circulating blood system. In the same way as a bath has a tap and a plug hole. Now if we've got, imagine a bath which uh, has got the plug half open, so um, and we want to try and get that we want to, our aim is to try and get the, the bath half full of water at all times. To do so, we're going to can increase our, our tap, the water flow at the tap, to try and match the outflow of, uh, of, of water from the plug hole. And our, our eye has to do this, has to, has to balance this production and, and drainage of fluid, uh, both in, in a normal day-to-day -day maintenance of the eye, but also during pathology. So in our eye, we our tap is the, uh, the the epithelium of the ciliary process, which cover the ciliary processes uh, in the ciliary body, and these produce aqueous humor, which then drains into the posterior chamber, this potential space between the zonules, the back of the iris, and the equatorial lens. From here, aqueous humor will pass into the anterior segment, sorry, into the anterior chamber, and then will exit the eye through the irido iris corneal angle, the irido-corneal angle, uh, what we we'll call the drainage angle, back into the back of the ciliary process and then off into the um, into the blood to be absorbed with blood supply. We can examine the, uh, the drainage angle using a gonio lens, which is a specialist lens uh, which we attach to the surface of the cornea. And this allows us to look around the corner and you can see the pupil here from the iris going away from us. And then we can see the, this wide open drainage angle uh, with these uh, pect, lovely fine pectinate ligaments covering the entrance and we can then see the back of the sclera, the edge of the sclera, sorry, the limbus and then the cornea as you look uh, across this eye. So the, the drainage angle is equivalent to the, uh, the, the drainage plug in that bath and the tap is the, um, uh, the functional equivalent of the tap is the ciliary processes. This is a, a prep from a horse, the lens is sprinkled because of the preparatory process and we can see the iris here posterior chamber and, how, and see how, th how closely adherent the iris is to the anterior lens capsule. That's why it's so easy for these posterior pigmented epithelial cells to stick to the lens. You've actually done so in this prep. And then into the anterior chamber and the drainage angle here. So this 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 structure here, the ciliary body, is um, responsible both for production and drainage of aqueous humour. So same prep, but um, looking, focusing a bit deeper, we can actually see deep, deep into the drainage angle of the horse. And we can see the other side of the iris, these beautifully uh, applicated uh, ciliary processes. Glaucoma is our greatest challenge. It's the, it's the disease which we, uh, as ophthalmologists, are still um, looking for the magic treatment, which is yet to arrive. It's the commonest reason to remove our, our, our dog's and cat's uh, eyes. And uh, sadly, it's commonly bilateral nucleation is the outcome for many of these patients or euthanasia. It can be a very painful disease, particularly in the acute angle closure glaucomas. And sadly, when presented to your sales or to us, and second up in your practice, the uh, the first eye is often blind on uh, on admission, um, and which and the second and the second eye may also have pathology. Medication uh, is is available and gets better with every passing decade. Um, the changes in medication are slow. The last big movement, I guess, would have been the introduction of prostaglandins, which is over 20 years ago now. Uh, there have been no real uh, real medical advances in, in ophthalmology, medical treatment ophthalmology since then. Though there are different sorts of prostaglandins and combination drugs available. The drugs are expensive and uh, sadly are doomed to failure in most cases. And there are very few dogs who um, have their where their glaucoma is managed medically and they, return, and they regain vision or even their eye until the end of their days. Surgical options uh, likely carry the best long-term prognosis, but only men performed early in the disease and they are not without problems. 
So what causes glaucoma? It, it is always a disease of the drain. It's always an outflow disease. It's always caused by blocked drains. Going back to our bath analogy, there's no form of glaucoma caused by overproduction of aqueous humor. It's all about blocked drains. That can be a primary abnormality of the drainage system, which we see in angle closure glaucoma, and it's inherited in many breeds. It's a, a, a list of some of the ones recognized in the UK on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, and that's, that's probably the, that is the commonest reason for uh, glaucoma in the UK and across the world. Secondary glaucoma um, is caused by a secondary, uh, rather primary anatomical but, uh, problem with the ganglia, or something which has affected it, and that can be uh, lens luxation where the uh, vitreous comes forward and fills the pupil and blocks that uh, blocks the exit from the and posterior chamber to the anterior chamber um, or it can be uveitis caused by both um, short-term inflammation closing the angle or more commonly chronic uveitis causing iridocorneal adhesions and blocking the entrance to that drainage angle uh, tumors um, intraocular tumors thankfully with a few exceptions, rarely leave the eye, but they do will eventually fill the eye and block the outflow and cause secondary glaucoma. Trauma uh, can cause glaucoma also, especially blunt trauma. We have large blood clots and and, and large areas of the drain jungle damaged as the iris moves backwards. So what does it look like? Well, first point I guess to make is you can't guess by looking at an eye whether it's got glaucoma um, or, in fact, uveitis. Both glaucoma and uveitis can present with red eyes, with corneal edema, with um, pupil changes, either meiosis or, or medriasis. Classically, we think of glaucoma as having a dilated or mid-dilated pupil. We think of uveitis having a small pupil, but it isn't always as simple as that. Uh, the key real point really is, is measuring the intraocular pressure. Another key point is, is that any dog who has glaucoma particularly acute glaucoma, may have uveitis as well, so may have aqueous flare, for example. Um, so corneal edema is common, uh, but not always seen in all cases. Episcleral congestion, as we refer to, is this, this um, uh, due to the increased pressure in the eye, we get a shunting of, uh, we get congestion of these episcleral vessels. So it's very typical, typically these, these convoluted vessels we see here, but also an anterior uveitis, we'll see something called ciliary flush, which you see looks similar, but will actually be a little bit more located above the, um, above the ciliary processes. But, but so redness of the white of the eye isn't pathognomonic for uveitis or glaucoma that we do describe episcleral congestion, these congested vessels in glaucoma cases. It is often a painful disease, and particularly in chronic disease, um, dogs and cats can seem to cope well with it. Gentle palpation of the glaucomatous globe will, however, often give a readily aversive response. So um, one of our biggest challenges is the terrier breeds who are very stoic by nature. And particularly in the, the chronic lens luxation cases, it's not uncommon to have dogs who apparently are very happy despite having very high pressures. What we do see in that group of dogs, however, is when we nucleate or treat successfully, we see a dramatic improvement in behaviour. So just because terriers appear not to be showing pain, that doesn't mean they don't. So a few hints, early diagnosis is essential. Um, and if you haven't got access to tonometry, then knowing where your nearest tonometer is, be it a local practice, another branch, or your local ophthalmologist, is, is really important to know. Um, you can't guess the intraocular pressure by looking at, just looking at the eye. You can palpate the eye through a closed lid um, and get an appreciation of a very hard globe. But the pressure has to be very high before you can appreciate that. Yeah, uh, you can, and with a very simple, if, if you really had to, um, with no access to tonometry, you can assess the uh, intraocular pressure in a more accurate way than, than um, palpating the globe with a, through a closed lid using a cotton bud. A cotton bud gently in, to gently touch the eye at the limbus, this area here, so on, not on the corneal side, but the scleral side, to gently indent the globe. A very soft nuviatic globe will readily indent, whereas a hard globe will not. And comparing the two eyes can be very useful uh, as, as a screening test. Um, one final hint tip I guess is that of the drugs we do have available in practice the prostaglandins are the are the most potent at reducing intraocular pressure uh, and so having access to a bottle of travertan or zalatan or latanoprost which is the generic form and therefore much cheaper uh, is very sensible but you must be aware that it really is only for angle closure glaucoma and um, animals with primary lens luxation, you can make things significantly worse by constricting, because the, these drugs will constrict the pupil and can trap the lens in the anterior chamber and trap the vitreous in the pupil. Uh, 
So being aware, having access to some prostaglandins, measuring intra, being able to measure intraocular pressure or, ass or assess it, um, uh, and also being able to aware how to diagnose the lens luxation are three essential skills to try and save these patients' eyes and the phone number of your local specialist centre. Tonometry, um, we prefer the Tonavet. Um, so my colleagues um, using the instrument, we love these instruments. They're very gentle, uh, they're accurate. They give a slightly different range of um, uh, meetings to our um, uh, Tonopen, but so the Tonovet is our preference. No electron settings needed. The, tono, the Tonopen is the one which we used for many years. This is um, the, this is the gold standard in, in as much as it will give us the most uh, reliable intraocular pressure compared to tonometry readings in, in the eye, manometer readings from the eye. Sorry, but it does have. Uh, some challenges. It's more tricky to use. You need local anaesthetic. You need to have these disposable condoms. You have to have disposable tips, the Tonovet as well, I guess. But um, we do have these in the clinic, but nowadays we would only use the Tonovet. It's important to use the same instrument between patients. So a Tonovet reading and a Tonopen reading will give different readings. So when you, if you do have both instruments in your practice, make sure when you record it, you, um, you measure, you record the actual the instrument use. These images are from my colleague Brian Patterson uh, who used to work together many years ago uh, and he's using it on a horse in the image below which is a good illustration of the power of this tool is that uh, you don't have to use it at a specific angle. You have to be perpendicular, exactly perpendicular to the cornea but you can use it upside down left right whereas the tonovet has to be used horizontally. Um, Finally, the SHIOS tonometer is, if you have no access to electronic tonometry, is very useful to have in the practice. These need a little bit of practice. Um, potentially, they can be more damaging to the cornea, so you need to put some uh, protective lubricant in the eye. Uh, we would use clinitas, which is a preservative free hyaluronate, some local anaesthetic, and you want a patient to, to be held gently so that we can have the eye effectively horizontal to the floor as best as possible because these instruments have to be used vertically. Um, they are fiddly but they can give very accurate results. They cost less than £100 and second hand you can pick them up for pennies and if you have no electron electronic tonometry having this to practice is, is important. We've mentioned cotton buds. Gentle indentation can give us an estimate uh, but it's important not to do is this is from the, the glass rods can be sold for the same purpose but you can just do the same with a, a um, cotton bed but we would this is from their website actually so we would use not to do it on the cornea do it on the limbus and that can be a useful tip perhaps when you have a patient to sleep next just gently try and uh, see if you can uh, gently indent the cornea sorry the, the, the globe the limbus to, to, to assess uh, what it feels like medical treatment is sadly doomed to failure in general they do a number of things. We, most of them are looking at reducing production, turning the tap down in a bath. Um, some of them will increase outflow, so the prostaglandins we believe will, will do that by increasing flow, what we we'll call the alternate pathway. We want to reduce the inflammation associated with glaucoma and topical steroids are often our most powerful drug for that and protect the retina. The calcium channel blockers, particularly amlodipine uh, and systemic steroids we, we use in dogs during the acute glaucoma who have gone blind to try and protect that retina and block the, the cascade of, of um, inflammatory mediators which can go on to lead to retinal degeneration following pressure spikes. Um, the three drugs we use for reducing uh, for uh, hypotensive drugs, reducing pressure, the prostaglandins, which is Zalatan, which is Donoprost, and Travatan, um, which is Travaprost, the two common ones we use in, in the UK which can be used in combination with beta blockers, timolol being the, the, the most common one. Um, so uh, um, duotrav would be a common drug we would use in our clinic, which is travertan and timolol. That timolol on its own is uh, not particularly useful in our patients, in, in dogs, particularly in cats, uh, more so. Uh, more useful as a primary tool, but uh, we tend to use it as a, in combination with our, either our prostaglandins or carbonic and hydrogen inhibitors. So TrueSopt is the classical, uh, or Azopt are the two classical carbonic and hydrogen inhibitors, and they can be used with uh, as dual preparations as CoSopt, um, which is um, TrueSopt and Timolol and uh, Azaga, which is Azaga and Timolol. Uh, so surgical treatment, uh, these are old photographs, we don't do these techniques anymore. We used to use transscleral uh, laser photocoagulation, so it's a laser probe on a, on a, on a limbus of a horse. And so we still do this in the horse actually, but in dogs and cats we don't. Um, uh, the laser energy passes through the sclera, 
reaches the silly body and causes this silly body to explode. We actually listen to pops to hear we to know we're in the right place. And we then try and destroy a certain number of silly processes using this technique. It's very destructive and causes secondary inflammation, which in itself can drive, um, make pressure control very difficult. So uh, transtelleral photocycloagulation, we, uh, we don't use in dogs and cats anymore, but we, we do occasionally in horse. Another treatment we used to use was to try and freeze the ciliary process doing cyclo uh, cryo uh, destructive techniques um, and that can be useful too as a, a salvage procedure but again it's very destructive and this was tended to be reserved for blind eyes even when we did did it uh, nowadays we uh, we do still use the the principle of trying to destroy the um the sensory body epithelium but we try and do it in a more targeted way this is a a, a new relatively new i've been using it for the last 10 or 15 years treatment called endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation or ecp this is a beautiful piece of engineering a very small endoscope about the size of a 21 gauge needle containing both laser light and, uh, and uh, image camera allows us to visualize the ciliary processes uh, uh, using um, uh, familiar cataract type incisions we go inside the eye with our probe identify the ciliary processes so we can individually with a titrated dose of laser energy, slowly shrivel up individual laser, uh, individual silly processes. This 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 um, procedure, where carried out before the onset of glaucoma, or right at the beginning of onset of glaucoma, before the secondary damage to the eye, can be a very effective. The problem is, is once most of our patients reach us, they've already had acute glaucoma and gone on to the more chronic, damaging signs of intraocular change, which allow, which don't allow us to use ECP. This is really most commonly used um, in our clinic for the second eye of acute angle closure glaucoma inherited disease, where the first eye has come to us with diagnosed glaucoma and the second eye has yet to develop glaucoma, yet we know it's got an abnormal angle and it will do so in the next 12 months. Those patients can do very well with ECP. And the second group of patients we would use it for are dogs coming in for elective cataract surgery who we know have got abnormal drainage angles and a breed predisposition to glaucoma uh, and we would then do a combined procedure of ECP uh, after the cataract removal. So um, in certain cases it can be life-changing but really is only for a small number of specific cases. Sadly most of our cases um, by the time we can meet them the it's too late for turning the tap down permanently with our ECP procedure. We have to try and find an alternate drainage pathway that brings on to the glaucoma shunts. There are different ones available. We talk we think of having temporary shunts and long-term shunts temporary shunts such as the armored valve can keep pressure down for six to 12 months sometimes as long as 18 months with revisional surgery uh, there is we, we, in preference i always like to place a, a permanent shunt um, this this is the cullen drain um, no longer sadly may we manufacture our own now and the cullen drains can for some dogs give a long-term solution that can last for many years and certainly some of our patients have died visual while still having these shunts in their eyes uh, having been there for many years the cullen drain it, it starts off with a in similar to the standard short acting drains where the small silicon tube goes inside the anterior chamber and that's that rely, that gives us our, our drainage outflow the other end of that long tube is um, passed into a hole drilled in the frontal sinus and, and tunneled under the upper eyelid and then the 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 ex through a valved opening excess aqueous humor leaves the um leaves the eye and enters into the into the frontal sinus and then absorbed across the mucosa they're not without problems um the eye in the short term is there is inflammation associated with it and in the first um, few days this is fibrin building up around the shunt these eyes have to be managed very carefully and sometimes intraocular injections of a clot busting drug such as tissue plasminogen activating factor are needed to try and keep these, these shunts open um, that brings us on nicely to primary lens luxation so the other sort of surgical that uh, form of glaucoma we see this is a disease this is a ubm an ultrasonic biomicroscope so very high resolution ultrasound is actually a human eye we have a similar machine in our clinic and you can actually see individual zonal fibers and this is the um, the base of the uh, iris in this uh, in this human patient and this is the edge of the lens and it's a disease of these zonal fibers they become loose and then particularly our terriers you like to shake their heads they snap the lens will come come, come loose and start to wander around in the eye uh, and often we'll see 
the eye being the, the lens remaining just behind the pupil held in place by the vitreal body behind it uh, but falling down to show us this aphakic crescent and, and that the vitreal body is an important part of understanding the pathology of lens luxation this image from a human eye but no Again, this orange area is the vitreous and it's supporting this lens. As the lens starts to loosen, move backwards and forwards, it allows the vitreous to move forward. If the vitreous moves forward and between the lens and the iris, uh, then it can block the flow of aqueous humor. And that's what causes the acute increase in drug pressure we see in our patients, which can be blinding very quickly. So uh, when we see a, a, a lens in the anterior chamber, it's, it's best to consider an ophthalmic emergency. Um, the younger the dog, the more emergent that is, the, because the vitreous will be larger and more prone to blocking the, um, the pupil and therefore causing acute pressure spikes. Inherited in terriers and collies and also other breeds such as like Shahila and Sharpays, um, we, we do, um, but the Jack Russell would be our typical patient. Head shaking exacerbates the lens coming cute, uh, um, coming loose acutely, and perhaps perhaps why we see uh, terriers present at a younger age than collies who are much more sensible. Sadly, um, by the time we see the the front, uh, the, the, when it cues, when it presents with one eye being blind. Uh, so, uh, if the dog presents blind, it often means that the first eye has been blind for a little while, and so when the second eye has gone blind, that the the patient is now now blinded, and given terriers propensity for being so stoic it's not unusual for us to get to meet dogs where actually the one acutely blind eye has got a chronically blind eye which is non-salvageable um, prognosis therefore is um, really down to the stage of presentation and, and and what you can do in your clinics is when you see your small terrier breeds and your sharp eyes and your collies is to when you look at the eyes to look at the anterior chamber depth and particularly look for vitreal prolapse bits of little tough tufts of cotton wool like capacity at the pupil margin which will suggest to you that the your fibers are starting to break. Uh, with surgery um, these dogs can do really well uh, but early surgery particularly. Um, uh, the Traditionally an open sky technique is, is performs a large incision through the cornea and removes the lens entire. Um, there's good evidence, very good evidence that uh, the uh, prognosis for vision and particularly glaucoma in these patients is, and radical attachment is better if you remove the lens via small incision surgery as you would in cataract surgery. Uh, this isn't done at all centers because it's a, uh, it's a more ch much more challenging than normal cataract surgery. It's also more expensive but open sky techniques. There are some very talented surgeons out there who do this very well but uh, given a choice between a, an open sky technique and a small incision surgery, then um, my advice would be to consider small incision surgery as, as, as the gold standard. The um, risk of attachment particularly is, is, is um, much lower. Uh, it is possible to replace the lens with, a, with an intraocular lens. It has to be secured in a different way to normal and then by sutures. And that's one of my particular clinical interests is using the sutured intraocular lenses. And in, in certainly in our clinic, we look back at our patients, the incidence of glaucoma and retinal detachment and certainly the visual performance of these patients is much better when they have a sutured intraocular lens placed in our hands anyway. The, uh, uh, where the, the second eye isn't blind at uh, presentation and just the first one is luxated, it's very common to see the other lenses about to luxate or, so, or maybe partially sub subluxated. Um, those lenses still need addressing. It's possible to use myotics long term, such as Travertan or Zalatan, every 12 hours to keep the pupil small and stop it moving forward. But better is to, but, 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 but much better uh, prognosis is gained by removing that lens uh, either uh, entirely. Uh, including the caption placing super suture and trochial lens or sometimes we can actually save the lens capsule um, using one of these little guys here the capsule attention rings so on top top right we can see the zonules of this patient have only been lost in about a third of the the equator and then we'll see vitreal prolapse coming through the pupil at this point at this point if we remove the lens contents place an artificial lens and an expanding acrylic ring, the red line you can see one over here, these expanding acrylic rings, they will push out, giving equatorial push. Uh, and just like those pop-up tents you have at festivals, it helps to, to give it some structure that reduces the strain on these remaining zonules and will therefore help to keep these lenses in position for, for much longer. This is a cadaver preparation looking from behind the, behind the pupil looking forward 
see the celery process which are bleached because they've been treated with endo laser and we've got the um, expanding acrylic ring you can see inside the lens capsule and the artificial lens so ctr sac capture tension rings um, this is a much quicker surgery than placing a suture in trochlear lens and uh, would be uh, and can give a very good outcome for our patients so that's uh, that finishes glaucoma so we're going to take another break and then we're going to carry on talking about the lens in a few minutes <laughs> 